Great, thanks, Sue Ann. Um, I'm Lena Curry. We'll do introductions, but there'll be three of us sharing this presentation, and I'm hoping that you'll see that we've sort of um, gotten into this collaborative back and forth, getting to know you uh, sort of vibe as we've collaborated to create this curriculum pilot um, to teach heritage preservation in public schools. So um, we have our parts, but I'm sure at some point we will you know, politely interrupt or add on to one another because that's sort of how the creative juices flow. Um, and we're really hoping that this leads into a great discussion. So please, as you have questions, type them into the chat as they come up. We can circle back to topics, um, but this is really meant to spark discussion and solicit feedback um, because it's a pilot program that we're putting on and we are about to do the first run. Happens, we're good. Okay. So the three of us um, come from different backgrounds, um, as was sort of the intent from the beginning. Um, I'm a building and closure preservation engineer and have done student mentoring off and on throughout my career. I'm the current president and student outreach chair of the Association of Preservation Technologies Northeast chapter. I'm also the co-chair of APTI International's Academics and Research Committee with Michael. And I'll let Kate introduce herself. She's our curriculum coordinator. Hi, yes, I was, uh, I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm a former school principal and academic director at Boston area um, elementary and middle schools. And then I've also done a lot of um, work in other states um, supporting principals and, um, and school teams. And I'm really thrilled to be able to work on this work, which is um, connects to much, much er earlier love um, when I was going to school for uh, historic preservation and planning. All right, and then Mika, I don't know if she's on the call yet, but hopefully she'll join us shortly. But Mika and I um, used to work together and she's structural engineer by trade and really passionate advocate and student mentor. Um, she's also the STEM curriculum coordinator for the Girl Scouts of America and has a lot of sort of outreach experience in various um, groups that serve uh, younger student ages. So the way the three of us all met um, is that we were doing sort of what I would call a typical professional intervention these days, which is, hey, we have a great idea for a hands-on workshop. You know, let's give the students some building supplies. Let's teach them a little bit about architecture and engineering and preservation. And let's go, you know, ignite that passion and, and see where it leads us. So the three of us got together with a few other collaborators to do a week long session with the Girls Inc. Um, Worcester, Massachusetts Eureka JV program, which services um, 12 students each summer um, in the middle school age range to teach them about you know, STEM careers and, and you know, introduce them to the different ways that they could apply that sort of STEM knowledge and education in a, in a career and, and sort of teaches leadership and confidence and all of those things. Um, that the girls really enjoy and, and need. So, so that is what brought us together. And you know, throughout that week experience, as I'm sure many of us have had, um, you know, the girls lit up. They, they, they made comments to the effect of, we wish this was taught in public school. We wish we did this every day. We want to be an architect. We want to be a preservationist. Um, and you know, that made us feel great. And, but it also made us feel like we needed to do something that um, was not just in an after school program or a summer camp program that's sort of by nature a little self selecting. You know, not everybody has the means to go to those after school programs or get to get transportation to and from those programs. So we really wanted to bring that authentic experiential learning um, and that engagement of the students in their community to the classroom um, where more students could, could access it. So the presentation today is gonna to talk a little bit about the motivation for this type of curriculum in a public school setting specifically, some key considerations and approaches that um, we walked through in the past year coming to the point that we're at now. Um, and then briefly sort of where we're at in terms of the pilot program and implementation and then open it up to an open discussion. I love that I'm seeing more faces too and I'm sorry my video is off but I think my internet just can't handle it. 
so the motivation, you know, none of this is shocking, right? This is a huge need in all STEAM professions um, and industries right now. But to increase the diversity of the pipeline for students who not only want to have a career in, in STEAM or preservation, but that choose to pursue higher education or choose to explore it beyond, um, you know, K through 12. Um, whether that be, uh, you know, Cornell University or a trade school or, or anything, a certi or certification program, we really just want to see them explore it further. Um, and in order to meet that goal of increasing the diversity of the pipeline, we really feel like we have to start at a pretty young age. Um, you know, in our conversations with other groups and organizations, it's clear how quickly even subconscious bias in the industry is perceived by students as young as second, you know, first and second grade. So really um, catching them early before, before they've sort of dismissed it as an option. Broaden the definition and understanding of STEAM, right? Um, what does it mean to be a STEAM professional? It's not, you know, always going to be a 10 year um, educational program that ends in, you know, some fancy letters at the end of your name. There are other members that are very, very valuable in the preservation community and that they all contribute something. And so we need to broaden the definition of what it means to be a preservation um, professional in, in the context of STEAM um, so that it is more inclusive of different perspectives and different contributions. Uh, Kate's specialty is that one of the pitfalls of past um, academic interventions has been that we bring this really engaging content to the classroom, but it's not aligned with academic standards or goals. So it's not it's not really cohesive with everything else that the students are learning in their every day. Um, and that makes it potentially deterring to teach um, from the viewpoint of the educator. So we really want to align our content with grade level standards. We need to communicate and um, the need to memorialize, celebrate and protect all histories, which means being very deliberate about the content and deliberate about the examples that are presented to make sure that they're representing a diverse group of people and a diverse group of perspectives um, and not just sort of those iconic architecturally landmarked features um, that that some of us were trained to appreciate when we were in school. Um, provide a sustainable experiential and authentic learning experience and opportunity. Michael talked about this being an effective way to teach, um, to bridge language gaps, um, educational gaps, is to have that experiential uh, learning opportunity and to make it relevant, right? Like this is something we really do in our daily lives to get the students to buy in. And what I mean by sustainable is, you know, getting away from only doing those sort of helicopter discrete interventions, but making it something that can that can live and update and come back every single year with more relevant content. Hi, Mika, I see you joined us now. This is our other speaker, Mika. Um, and, and then lastly, build an appreciation for the student's own community. And, you know, one of the 1950s curriculum that Michael showed in the bottom right hand corner, it said, you know, all preservation should be founded in the student's local issues problem. So that, again, you're engaging the student to be the problem solver and you're using and pulling on content that they see in their everyday lives. And it just builds on that relevance. So while none of these motivating factors is eye opening, it's surprisingly difficult to do all of these things all at once. Um, and that is something that we've been very intentional about trying to do. Um, so with that, I want to get a little bit into the approach, which is gonna be the bulk of what we talk about because all of these different factors are how we, how we tried to achieve the goals of the curriculum from the onset um, and why it's taken sort of, you know, the lesser part of a year to get to this point where we're at. So the first thing was to identify target schools. I'm fortunate enough to have a partner who's a middle school teacher that has uh, local connections to a lot of different public school educators and principals. So one of the schools that I have a local connection to is the Boston Renaissance Charter Public School. And the reason that they were a good selection for this pilot is because they have in the past partnered with professional organizations to do hands-on learning competitions and um, community sort of science fair projects. And so they're open to working with professionals. They see the value in it. 
The other thing is that um, they serve a diverse population of students. In uh, 2020, they had about 1,000 students, 15% were English learners, 60% were classified as economically disadvantaged, 70% were classified as high need students, 60% were classified as African American or self identified as African American or Black, and 30% of the student body identified as Hispanic or Latino. So in all sort of situations, they, they, this school serves the population that we're really looking to make sure gets exposure. And then they're open to professional input um, at, at the principal and leadership level. Another reason that we targeted this school is because of the grade level it serves. It's a K through six um, program. So we were targeting the sixth grade class, understanding that we could potentially branch into lower ages that build up to the sixth grade level. But what's so fascinating as a professional coming into this experience is how much learning in science and technology happens in middle school, specifically in sixth and seventh grade. What Kate was explaining this to me and she was explaining the standards and she was explaining all of the evidence there is for middle school learning being such a peak time. And what actually helped me as a professional understand was to look at some of the exam questions that these students are asked um, there's a gap in the science and technology testing in Massachusetts in sixth and seventh grade. So, but if you look at fifth grade and eighth grade questions, you can really see how much learning is expected in grades six and seven. So here are some sample grade five exam questions. And you can see that they're sort of learning about natural resources, you know, what produces energy, how light reflects off objects, how our eye perceives an object. You know, they're getting into the concept of renewable energy um, and they're getting into a little bit about strength of materials, sort of flexibility, hardness, weight. And so that all makes sense. That's sort of general. I, I would have expected that. Um, but then you go to an eighth grade exam and all of a sudden, you know, the content in terms of, you know, what I see as an engineer working in preservation is much more rigorous. Um, there's a lot of focus on bridge design, strength, compression, tension. There's a question here about you know, understanding the cause for cracking in a foundation wall. They ask about site plans, floor plans. Um, you know, they're asking the student not just to know information, but to discuss and describe advantages and disadvantages of different design concepts. So again, the way that the, the student's brain between grade five and grade eight is being expected to learn and grow and, and articulate itself um, it just reinforced what Kate had told us from the onset, which is middle school is such an amazing time to intervene. And then Kate, I don't know if you want to add a little bit. Um, it's just, to, I mean, it's like, like Lena say, it's super hot and the brain is, is developing all sorts of uh, neuro, neuro pathways. It's also pruning. So one of the, um, some of the research that I was reading is whatever kids are doing right now and specifically when they're 12 and sixth grade, is what the brain is hardwiring and also what they're not doing is actually getting pruned away so if you're stimulating them with a lot of hands-on learning and you're integrating it with your, their math and their science um, content and making it relevant um, that is is actually like you know kind of um, solidifying certain pathways in their brains and then um, and then whereas if you know they're just kind of not doing those things, they're participating in rote learning and they don't get to apply their learning, then then those sort of things aren't getting stimulated and, and won't grow as well in the successive years. That's, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then, um, so the next thing in terms of approach that we, and Michael alluded to this, is really understanding what's going on now. We talked a bit about this a little bit in the break. Some of you might have stepped away. Um, but between the 1990s and now, because there was lack of, of government federal funding, it really fell on the shoulders of individual organizations and people to promote this type of learning in public schools or with uh, the population that public schools serve. So the first step was really understanding what's out there now and what has what has been tried before and where did it potentially fall short or what could we learn from it and, and how could we not reinvent the wheel and start from you know the the beginning um, and one of the things we looked at was that 1970s and 80s national trust curriculum that michael mentioned and they had a lot of really interesting activities and ideas and thoughts for for units 
one of which was, you know, pick a historic building and write a news article about saving the building. Um, and that really resonated with us in terms of encouraging the students to be the advocate, right? Um, to put them in the professional shoes to make an argument to save a place. So in this case, you know, there's a matter of updating past attempts and past content, right? Making it more highly visual, you know, breaking it down in a little bit more detail. Okay, what's your emotional hook? What's the quantitative data? You know, who's your who's your audience, right? And then leveraging, you know, the National Trust has savingplaces.org, which keeps track of the 11 most endangered buildings and sites um, as they've defined them. Um, and there's a lot of great content. So, so pointing the students to that content that is being updated by a professional organization that, again, takes the burden off the teachers having to find all of those resources themselves. Um, we felt like was this was a, an example where we could take something that had been done before and pretty quickly and easily update it to be relevant. Another example is, you know, talking about geometric shapes and forms, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional. And that's apparently a very important fifth and sixth grade mathematical skill, which is slicing three-dimensional objects and turning them into two-dimensional two shapes. So again, you know, maybe part of this exercise is just updating and using free online educational software. These images were done in SketchUp to let the students play around with different shapes. And then you can even, you know, assign different material qualities to the shapes. And the students can start to just in, intuitively understand how light travels through glass differently um, than a concrete wall, if at all. And then, um, you know, this is also being used readily. I guess Kate told me the other day that her son is using this in his sixth grade class, which is free online bridge design software. And it's interesting to me because my first five years of my career were as a bridge designer and inspector. And then I got sort of more into building design and uh, restoration. But I think we oftentimes when we go into schools and we talk about preservation, we forget about sites and bridges because that's part of our landscape. It's part of our built environment. And again, there's just a lot of online tools that allow the students to quickly, easily play, manipulate and under start to see um, how these things change and, and deflect um, when you take something away or add it or make it bigger or smaller. Um, so just using, using available software is, is another way that we can easily update sort of past knowledge. And the reason I like the bridge example too is because there's right now um, at RISD or just recently a graduate school class that took on the task of um, creating a pedestrian pathway for the Pell Bridge in Rhode Island. So again, it's not like we're going in there and we're telling students, hey, you should do this just because we say so. You know, we're showing them, hey, this could develop into a practice. This could develop into an area of specialty. Like, look at these students who are not that much older than you. And they are, you know, pitching these really realistic design and renderings, and they're trying to get the public to buy into this intervention. And um, again, I think everything that we introduce needs to be grounded, and they need to see the progression into the industry without it being too intimidating. And then one last um, example from the 1970s and 80s curriculum was this focus on architectural features. Um, you know, what's a gable end? What's a porch? What's a dental molding? All those things. But I think, and this was for us, for I believe it was Chicago based, so potentially they have, you know, this type of architecture there more readily. But thinking about applying this to Boston, you know, I was going through, you know, the streets and the sidewalks and everything around the pilot school, and I didn't see very much of this architecture, right? So one of the things we consciously did was we were de-emphasizing architectural terminology. Um, you know, we feel like that's very important and relevant, but just not at this age level. In the same way you would introduce the field of medicine without getting into the terminology of a triple double bypass and things like that. It's like, no, the emphasis right now is that we're trying to save places. So let's focus on the places that they can relate to, that they see. And one of the places that stood out to me that's just across the street from Boston Renaissance um, School is a concrete skate park. And a lot of people who know me professionally know that I have a, a soft spot for brutalist exposed concrete architecture, and there's a lot of it in Boston and Cambridge. So what better way to introduce a, an, an architectural style that's prevalent in the Boston area to the students 
than the, the geometric concrete forms that are just across the street. And one of the things I really love about concrete is, is how it weathers and how, how you can tell which surfaces are, are more sheltered or more exposed or more beaten down by the elements because of the sand that's exposed and the cement that's worn away. So I can imagine in a skate park, you know, where the top horizontal surface is completely exposed, the vertical walls are more sheltered, or where someone's running their skateboard along the edge all the time, you can physically see the concrete is different in those areas. And so you can make those connections with sites that are literally a five minute walk from the school. Another thing that we want to do consciously um, that we feel like other curriculums and other uh, groups have, have done pretty well is we want to encourage the students' perspective and their voice, right? So we want to present them, and this is something that I was recently watching a webinar that the Getty put on, and they were talking about uh, building visual literacy to look at a piece of art. And the same concepts apply when you're looking at a building or you're looking at a site or you're looking at a scene, right? Um, and I think the focus here is that there's no right or wrong. There are literally published articles that hate this building and there are published articles that love this building. And, you know, it's intriguing. And to think what goes on inside this building and what feelings do you do you have when you walk up to this building? Um, you know, I think that we need to prompt them with examples that are nearby. This is in Cambridge, so not too far from the pilot site. And also ones that are intriguing and lead to bigger picture discussions um, that the students can take ownership over. So this, these were tips again from that same Getty webinar um, about how to promote student-driven discussions by using real world examples um, that open up bigger ideas and discussions and contain a lot of visual details and cues and activate you know, intrigue without stumping. They talked a lot about being deliberate about the complexity of the image or, or the subject that you're showing the students. Um, you want it to promote discussion, but you don't want it to be so obvious that discussion can't take uh, tangents and blossom. And then you can encourage them to use different types of comments, um, you know, make them build on one another's comments. And that's again, you know, we all, many of us who are architects by trade have been through design critiques where we have to listen to our peers' opinions and we have to take their input and incorporate it into our design. And so this is the very beginnings of opening yourself up to other perspectives and having to build on, you know, that, that collective creativity. And I think, you know, we're really trying to teach the students how to notice. And this is, you know, I have a six-year-old son who loves doing these little books and activities and just identifying what's different. You know, it's a skill that we all have from a very early age when we notice something. We love routines. We notice when something's off. And just tying that simple skill that just needs a lot of development and practice into how it helps in preservation and how it really is the foundation of preservation. You know, we look at building sites and we observe when things are different. We observe when there is section loss. We observe when something has fallen off or doesn't look like it's the same color. You know, in this example, clearly there's been masonry interventions. And so then that sparks the, the next question of why. Um, but again, bringing it back to their local community, these are three pictures that I took down the street from the pilot school where, you know, the students could lead a discussion on what, what do we notice? What's the first thing that jumps out at you? And then, you know, lead them into what is it about the materials that are different? What are, why is the paint missing in some areas? You know, is the brick a different color? Did you expect there to be more windows in the middle image? Um, and then to sort of get them eventually toward, well, why do you think the materials look different in this area? You know, is there a roof leak in the left image? You know, has someone infilled the windows that once were in the middle image? And then are those air conditioning units potentially exhausting hot air that's peeling the paint in that area in the right image? And again, the building doesn't have to be uh, one of a kind in order to have those kinds of conversation. But this tool and skill set that they can use in their own communities is directly applicable to the field of preservation and what we do on a daily basis when we're diagnosing buildings and, and trying to understand what they need. Um, another curriculum 
standard sort of for this age level that we think is very applicable and, and intuitive when you get into it is what is the point of a cross section? What is, the, what is the envelope of a building? What is the structure of a building? And why would you wanna cut through it to understand it better? Well, what do we cut, what have we already cut through in education? You know, they've cut through the earth's surface. They've cut through a, a cell in the body. You cut through your fruit every morning when you are making breakfast. Um, we cut through things to learn about them and to and to wonder about them in a different way. So there's this potential to show them an image of a building from the outside only, and then to show them a cross section of that same building or site and see, okay, well, what additional information have we gained? And then as Michael hit on, and you know, what brought the three of us all together is, is having to maintain that experiential learning experience um, without taxing the teacher to go out and buy supplies and keep the supply cabinet stocked. So part of this curriculum initiative is to develop kits for whether the classroom be held virtually or in person so that every student has the materials that they need to, um, to enhance what they're learning in the units. And then with that, I want to hand it off to Mika to talk a little bit about some of the vocabulary and topics that we're focusing on. And Jelena, I'm sorry I missed introductions here. I was uh, rushing from place to place. Um, so uh, as, as Lena had mentioned, um, we really are trying to do this differently. And I think when I've done this before, I often go into classrooms or work with different groups. And even when I was a student myself, I often struggled with why am I doing this? Um, I've pursued a career in engineering and as, as good as I was at math and science to some degree, I really did struggle with, with trying to find a purpose for it. And as soon as I got an application for it and I understood what I was doing and why I was doing it, it made everything else kind of fall into place. So instead of taking the more traditional route of, here is your calculus, now you go apply it as part of engineering, we kind of flipped it back a little bit and thought, these are the buildings, this is how they affect you, this is, this is your community, this is your society, getting the students buy-in ahead of time before kind of diving into a little bit more of the technical content that is age appropriate. Um, so one of the first things that we try to introduce is the built environment as it relates to community and what is the student's individual community and getting them to start thinking about what's important to them and what's around them and allowing them to choose a way to communicate that that's simple and comfortable for them. So this idea of universal learning, um, if the students are more visual, they can do a poster, or if they prefer oral communication, they can do a presentation and making it very, very easy, not necessarily easy content wise, but it should be comfortable for them. And I think allowing this concept to not be daunting and not overwhelming and really personal allows, you know, we've got the student teachers by and we've, we've convinced the teachers that yes, this is an easy thing, an important thing to teach, but we want the students to have a reason to be learning it and be engaged. Um, so after we kind of go on this community, we talk about some more topical things, um, you know, things that are very relevant you know, currently. So equity being one of them and how do we, how are we thinking about diversity and equality and how does that pertain to these students? You know, this, this pilot school, um, and the schools that we would absolutely love to see pick up this type of programming are still schools with you know, a high level of diversity and you know, a high percentage of minorities in their student body. Um, so introducing the topic of equity and how spaces can be equitable or not equitable and how getting them thinking about what they like and what they don't like around them and what they would like to see improved. Um, and you know, once we allow them to think that, hey, you know, that is something that we could change giving them the tools and the vocabulary to start advocating for that change themselves. Um, so things like significance. So, you know, one of the things that we've talked about before is, you know, a pair of Converse sneakers. And while any pair of Converse sneakers is just a pair of Converse sneakers, Kamala Harris wears them all the time and that makes her particular pair significant. So is there something these students are talking about around them that, you know, that might just be an old community center around the building or corner from them and anyone else could walk by it and think, you know, it's not important. But if that's someplace that they go and they feel safe and they are engaging in their community and in their society, then that might be something significant to them and giving the vocabulary to advocate for it to be significant to somebody else as well. 
you know, and as we talk about equity and significance, um, understanding that what is what has been done historically is not only what needs to be done moving forward. So taking time to acknowledge that the values of today's society and the values of those particular students may not have been respected in a way in the past and just may not have been set up to last forever. So when we think about, you know, indigenous sites that have been, you know, flattened and leveled, it doesn't mean that that site shouldn't have some significance. And it doesn't mean that there's a no way for us to revive it in an appropriate way that pays respect to those areas. Um, you know, when we're dealing with students who are minorities and different, you know, historically black neighborhoods, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, we as a society did not think that those neighborhoods were important to save or preserve. And you know, there's buildings that have been demolished where it's, it's far too late to go back and recreate that building as a whole, but it doesn't mean we can't preserve the feeling or the, the history or the importance of that site in another way with a memorial or information um, that still pays homage to what was there once. Um, so again, this is some of the content that we've tried to incorporate um, and letting the students know, you know, things that have happened to different indigenous communities across the US, um, different minority groups, and letting them know that significance and something that's significance doesn't need to be something physical. It can be an idea or a concept or a piece of history as well. Um, you know, sustainability I, is a huge thing in the world of preservation and engineering and buildings right now. Um, and, you know, it's something that we're teaching in school. This is, the future is something that these children are going to have to deal with. And it's something that they're not blind to. They are paying attention to. Um, and thinking about things like tree equity as a concept we try and introduce and how, you know, green spaces are not necessarily given to different communities equally and how might they want to change what's around them and, and see more green spaces and how that, well, not a physical building is still something that we reserved and it's still something that we can incorporate into to their community um, and has some sense of importance to them and what it does for different stories out there. Yeah, and I think you touched on this, but, and also the concept of flexibility, you know, um, uh, and relevance, right? Like how, how usable is that historic space now, um, especially as technology has advanced and our community needs have evolved. Um, and this, this all feeds into, and we'll get into it in a, in a tiny bit about their, the unit and the curriculum sort of culminates in this community-based project that's Ta and that students are tasked with incorporating a, a sustainability or flexibility concept. Um, so it, it sort of ties itself together. We start with these concepts and we end up asking them to incorporate it in a, in a design project. And so then Kate's gonna talk about how we've tried to align this with Massachusetts standards. That's right. And I just wanna say everything that Mika just um, illustrated about um, you know, racial justice and indigenous peoples um, uh, kind of sites and properties. It's, it's not just the right thing to do in the way that the world is evolving. These are hooks for the students. The students really care about this. They care about racial justice. They care about the environment. You know, they think that, you know, all of people like our age and older were just disasters and we've set it up um, just wrong for them. And I can tell you those are exact words coming from my sixth graders, sixth grader. Um, and so um, so these are real hooks. And, they, and then that, that's, you know, if we were just talking to them about dry old buildings, that's not a hook for them. But if you say that this is a way of really um, making like the things you care about right now, um, alive and relevant, because people, we need to know our history better, then they're like, oh yeah, I wanna do that. And I will do the work um, to make all this happen. And so it's, it's, it's really relevant to the kids. Um, and then we can go to the next slide because this, this kind of gets into the standards um, because it has to be relevant and hooks for the kids, especially if we wanna be seeing this as a pipeline for, and, you know, diversifying the whole field. And it has to be really relevant and usable for the teaching staff. And so as a person who made decisions about the curriculum in, in schools and has worked with school systems, um, 
every school system nowadays is very concerned about being aligned with the standards. And rightly so. If pieces are aligned with the standards um, year after year, then those students, if they are proficient in the standards, are will should be prepared um, to be college ready. And we want to have that be the possibility for every one of our students. Whether or not they decide to do it is up to them, but we want that to be the possibility. And so the standards that we're really attuned to are this this STE standard. So that's science, technology, and engineering. And then the M is math. And so um, those are specific standards and they're in the common core. Um, the, there's different states. Different states have basically a, a, um, a, have their different uh, versions of their of the Common Core, but usually um, the the what's under the hood is the Common Core state standards, or the Common Core standards, and then the states will kind of put their spin on it. Um, Massachusetts, in particular, is uh, known for being uh, one of the states with the highest standards um, in the nation and the most alignment with um, the Common Core. So, just as happenstance being in Massachusetts, we are aligned, we aligned the curriculum to the Massachusetts state standards, but behind that is the Common Core and it has huge applicability um, into the state standards in other states. So I've done a lot of work in Maryland and, and in uh, Tennessee. I know that we're talking about doing work in California, so it's, it's very relevant. And um, like I said, as a decision maker at a school and certainly as a science and math and also general ed teacher, I need to make sure that I'm using my time um, in a way that's going to both engage my students and make sure that they do well um, in, in meeting these standards so that they're proficient on the on the tests. And so um, our curriculum hopefully meets that. And, um, and a big piece of this in the lower right corner is um, claim evidence reasoning. So we're working also with a uh, science teacher with 20 years of experience. And, you know, she's she's emphasized that the claim evidence reasoning um, way of approaching problems uh, is super important and consistent in engineering and in uh, in science teaching. Um, and then, of course, in the outside world, we're all knowing how relevant that is. So we can go to the next one. So this is this is great. Um, so we want to um, have the students involved in real life learning, and we want to be crossing disciplines as much as possible. And so, and we saw the earlier slide with the cells, and Lena was talking about the envelopes and the cross sections, and we're connecting it to the crust of the Earth and to um, an organic cell. Like we we're, we're constantly making those connections. Here in the upper right corner is we're making connections between um, geography and uh, geology, um, which they're definitely learning about right now, and building materials. Um, and um, so you can see that in the upper right. And then in the lower right, like what do you need in terms of durability if you're going to build a bridge? Um, so they're doing bridge projects, and then we're talking about the materials as well. We can go to the next one. Oh, and then um, and then arguments. So <laughs> Lena was explaining, and and I think you all understand this. Being in the fields, is uh, is he, you're always making um, emotional and technical arguments. And so we are teaching the kids as they're doing this claim evidence reasoning project to uh, to make the case um, for a historic site um, that they need to balance uh, the technical criteria with the emotional case. And so, um, so they're learning to do that. And uh, I'm working with a school system right now in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And one of the biggest demands that people in higher ed and in the careers are saying is that the students need to be able to publicly make cases, that they need to be able to um, articulate their points. They need to be able to speak in front of people. And so we're seeing that and giving them an early practice in sixth grade, assuming or hoping that they continue to build on that as they grow up through the high school. And again, this is uh, this is a project where um, the students, um, and this is in the architecture unit. Oh, I should probably actually say, where the curriculum is a six unit curriculum. Each unit is about a week long um, with about four lessons of uh, say 50 or 60 minutes in each lesson. 
Um, and the first two lessons are, Mika was describing in um, grounding them in identity and community and concepts of equity and environmentalism, um, and then it, in significance. And then the second um, third is one week on architecture and one week on engineering. And then the last third is their culminating project. And so in this um, unit, which is architecture, part of one of the hands-on projects is um, developing a paper house, um, figuring out the net area, um, doing a floor plan. Um, and, um, and then the, uh, the art extension is what would you do with a, in, in, in constructing a mural and, and having all the paint for that? I mean, they have to order the paint. So they're also working on um, concepts of, well, definitely um, area, but also scale and, um, and a multi-part questions around multiplication. Oh, and then um, I'm gonna let Mika talk about, about the bridge the bridge project um, since she was uh, the author of the engineering unit. And, um, but I just wanna say that my sixth grade son is literally doing this. He's not doing our curriculum right now, but he is doing uh, this bridge project. So it's, it's very relevant. So this, this stems from one of my favorite projects to work with when I get the chance to talk to students around this age level. Um, and you know, we teach them little bits about beams and columns and parts of a building as far as it turns engineering, but this is really the chance for them to be hands-on. And it's the chance for them to start this kind of trial and error process that makes up, you know, formally the scientific method, but really this engineering and architecture-based design process where you, you try something out, you make observations, you record those observations. I mean, you think about what you saw, what you experienced, what happened, and then use that information to make hypotheses and guesses about what you think is going to happen next to ultimately end up with the best design. Um, and really it allows, allows the students to play with and, and have these tangible things to see what's going on. Um, and I, I just love how physical it is, and it's a really good way to get their gears thinking um, and making choices based on what they've experienced in the past. Um, it's, it's a really fun one to, to have them participate in. Right, that's right. Right, and they're working as teams. And so um, so the kids are working in teams and they're practicing you know, teamwork and they're recording all of their observations and their notebook, their science notebooks. Um, so this next piece is around, again, kind of usability for teachers. And so if teachers have a curriculum and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just, um, it's too hard to figure out, um, they're so busy, it's going to be difficult. And so what we've done is we've designed every uh, unit has a scripted lesson with all of the details in it, literally, if you need it. You know, it's, it's all the, the activities and the timing for the activities. It's the scripting is what you would say. If you want to have background um, information, like one of our units contains a lot of information on the rehabilitation of the Lorraine Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee to become the National um, Civil Rights Museum. If you want to learn more about that yourself, there's links to that um, so that you can feel more confident teaching. Um, and then there's the whole PowerPoint deck that goes with it. So, um, and then as, as Lena said, there would be um, the list of materials um, and then hopefully we can provide um, kits as well as needed. Um, so, um, but for the most part, I think we'd like to have, we, we've required materials that are mostly gonna be on hand in most schools. And then on the right, you see here that there's the art extension materials, which I think is just so fun and cool because when the teachers do have extra time and you have the kids like meeting their their desires around being artistic is just so thrilling for them and I could also see a situation where the art teacher and um, the science teacher are collaborating and you know the art teacher is actively reinforcing the concepts that the um, that the science teacher is advancing oh and then um, everybody's always going to talk about this in a school. It's like, how you how are you assessing assessing learning? And so we have two ways that we're assessing um, student understanding and proficiency in the, uh, the objectives. Um, one is daily exit tickets. And so um, that's a really 
common way of assessing just like what did the kids understand today out of this this lesson and it's usually about two or three questions that they answer quickly in the last five minutes of school of the class and the reason it, and then the teacher takes that and they flip through the the exit tickets and they they they, they figure out kind of what worked and what didn't and what they might need to reteach but it's it's a really good um just quick uh pulse check and then and then of course their 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 products. So when they build things and they construct things, there's a lot of observable learning um, that the teachers will be able to um, to see, um, as well as seeing how they are they're working together and their collaboration. I think eventually um, in a version 2.0, we'll have pre and post assessments. Um, so that'll be a version that comes um, in the, in in the later. And then I just want to talk quickly, which will feed right into our discussion, which is planning for the sustainability of the curriculum and, you know, building this really coalition of contributors. Um, you know, thank you so much for to the National Council of Preservation Education for letting us, you know, show what we've been working on. Um, APT and AIA have also been involved and contributed to this effort. Um, and I think one of the ways that we as professionals uh, feel like we can stay involved and, and we can make this sort of sustainable. Um, and it's also a great learning opportunity for the students, as Kate mentioned, which is to have these sort of culminating community-based projects and showcases um, where the students are tasked with or develop and then defend a design concept. Um, and in this case, you know, our thought is that they would have to design or, or propose an intervention to their building. So this is the Boston Renaissance School building in Hyde Park, Massachusetts. And to, to prompt them, you know, do you want to add a sustainable feature like a green roof? Um, or do you want to enhance your outdoor space? You know, in teaching them about things like desired pathways and showing them Harvard Yard and how there's all these different pathways if you look down on it. Um, you know, because no student wants to to go from point A to point B in any way but a straight line, right? So, you know, is there a point in the building that they feel like it's just too long a walk from another point in the building? Could they create a bridge that connected those two spaces to shorten the distance? Um, and then by having this science fair type project, you invite the community into the school, you see the excitement on the students' faces, and the students are prompted to sort of defend their design idea several times to several different groups of people. And what I've heard is that you see the students really develop and hone in on their best arguments toward the end. And so it's something we all as professionals learn to do, you know, when a meeting goes well or doesn't go well, we sort of learn, you know, for next time. And, and this gives that, the students that opportunity. And I think really is the, the sort of capstone project that's going to, um, to help promote the success, um, as Kate said, to, to gauge the engagement and the effectiveness of it. So with that being said, this is a, a, a pilot program um, that we're hoping will only be another year or two to get to version, as Kate said, 2.0, maybe 3.0 before we, we ideally, um, you know, find a sort of larger source of funding and a, a broader implementation beyond what this, this group or coalition is doing. Um, but this is where we're at. And so again, the point of this all is to solicit your feedback to answer any questions and to really, you know, for the whole, for the whole timeline shown on the screen, we are continuously evolving. Um, one thing that Kate didn't mention is that all of the uh, documents that we've developed, all of the slides, all of the scripts, um, they're all editable in Google Docs. So there's no sophisticated software that you need. Um, you know, and the eye toward starting in Massachusetts, like Kate said, is that the standards are pretty rigorous and we feel confident in making the, all of the files adaptable that we can expand to multiple states next year. So with that, I wanted to open it up to any questions and appreciate everybody's time. Those people are kind of getting their thoughts together. They're, um was a discussion item that came up earlier and it maybe is, is kind of addressed to, to Anna um, is that there, there seem to be two st streams of preservation, the professional preservationist and then the patriotic um, amateurs, the, the ladies of preservation that were kind of taking place at the same time. 
And I know San Antonio is no different where, where both Anna and I are from in that the San Antonio Conservation Society started in 1924. But I'll add to that after, if you have anything you'd like to, to say, Anna. Yeah, and that's, that was really one of the, the goals of my research was to come to highlight that, that second, the more, you know, professional or professionalizing stream of early preservation history in the U.S. that kind of leads to um, where we are now in terms of this distinct field of practice, but with, even within our, our larger field of preservation, um, of course, we still maintain um, a, a wide variety of ways that you come into the profession. So I think, you know, there's a whole other story uh, out there about the professionalization of that advocate, almost amateur side, you know, that, that turns into, um, uh, you know, the people that, that, you know, run nonprofits like the Conservation Society that we have here in town and the people who continue to volunteer and do really important work, you know, they're, they are no less preservationist than I am, you know, in spite of all the degrees and things that, that I have. I think it's one of the things that I find really fascinating about this pilot program and the kind of behind the scenes discussions that I've been able to hear between Michael and Lena is, is this idea of how do we make sure that students and young people don't, don't see preservation as kind of this, A, know what it is as a profession, that it exists as a profession and an option. You know, I, I grew up with museum professional parents and I didn't know what architectural preservation was until I went to college, uh, which to me is kind of incredible. Um, so kind of knowing what that is, but also that you don't need to have a degree necessarily to get into this field, you know, also emphasizing the importance of building trades and all of those important hand skills that, that people, we, you know, we can't do our job. I can't do my job without those people. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the kind of beginnings of that in the late 19th century where you have the people that just care. They're really big advocates for historic buildings. They're trying to say, I know we're a young country, but look at the things we have. Obviously it's a very narrow lens, right? It's focused on, on Anglo-American revolution, British history. You know, it starts to get a little more into other colonial periods, especially here in San Antonio, obviously the missions and the Spanish colonial history, but it, it's, it's interesting to see those, those start to diverge in that, that era. And, and just kind of a plug again for the Conservation Society, um, <laughs> only because uh, for a couple of reasons, but one is that, you know, I've been a part of it for, for, for years and years and years, but it wasn't until recently that it was kind of, I was aware that we were really the first ones to include the, uh, other than buildings, you know, we weren't just going to- Landscapes, yeah, cultural, cultural landscapes. Cultural was landscapes. A term that they used in, the 20, mm -hmm. yeah. in, in 1924. So I mm -hmm. thought that was pretty amazing. And then just the other plug is uh, I was the president of the Conservation Society a few years back, and I was the first preservation professional in, what, 90 years to, to have that position because it's, it's been volunteers. Um, uh, and I was a volunteer too, but it was just, it's been the, the boots on the ground, you know, and women in this instance who have done a great deal of preservation around the country. And so with that very broad, you know, cultural landscape kind of focus as well as the building focus, which brings yeah. us kind of to where we are now in the preservation world, which is looking at cultural heritage, sustainability, and all of these crossovers that uh, I think make it maybe more relevant um, and gets us beyond this idea that preservation is, is kind of the society of no. So uh, uh, I, I think this is great. Um, one of the comments came in that... Um, okay, can I just add too, because oh, sure. a couple of, to the, to the question about the amateur versus the professional, right? Like we all know that there's a fear that if amateurs do preservation, we're gonna get these big mistakes. But I think that I've talked to a few people on this call, like the students are gonna love those mistakes, right? And they're gonna love understanding like what went wrong and why and why there's professionalism, right? But it just can't be, we can't come at them like 
we are only the the professionals that never make mistakes. Like we have to come to them in a human way. And we have to say there is the spectrum of people involved. And there have been instances where people stepped outside their lane or their comfort or their knowledge base. And again, I think that's going to excite the students and that's going to engage their opinion and feedback. Or, or even that professionals make mistakes. You know, we learn from things year after year or something that, you know, my boss did 30 years ago, we wouldn't do today. And I'm sure 40 years from now, something I did on the mission, someone's going to say, how could you have done that? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. I also just want to add, um, and you know, you're bringing it up with the, the materials and the local crafts people. And I want to give a shout out to to Ritika um, for um, uh, she was really helpful in, in bringing us to the um, the Gadi Bedic um, site in Nepal, and it really highlights um, using local materials, reusing materials, using local labor, and we highlighted that um, as as an aspect of sustainability. Um, that that sustainability is about um, it's it's about the environment and it's about um, the economy. Um, as well. And so, you know, like getting the kids to think about that and that that's all integrated into these ideas of historic preservation. There is a comment about, um, for Michael, it's like, I like the idea, Atlanta as your classroom, Uh, the city is a, is a class course book. And yes, I think every, every city could take that opportunity. And then the next discussion is, uh, you've done a great job of explaining why middle school students should care about buildings, landscapes, and et cetera. Uh, What are the barriers to their involvement? Kate, do you wanna start? (laughs) (laughs) To their involvement in the field or in the curriculum? Um, I mean, I I think that, Schools are challenged, um, school systems are challenged to integrate innovative curriculum. And, um, and that's why, you know, as, as uh, Mika and, and Lena were getting started at Girls Inc. And you could, you know, you a lot of times in after school programs, and I used to work at citizen schools as well, you have a lot more flexibility um, to, to bring innovative things to the students. And so, um, so I, think, I think that's one of the, the main barriers is, um, kind of the constraints at a school, especially uh, an under-resourced kind of urban school. Um, But I think that the more you can find those footholds, um, like we're doing with the Renaissance Charter School in Boston and be able to to prove it um, in those environments, the more likely you're gonna have district administrators at regular district schools um, pick it up. And from from the professional organizational side, in terms of seeing this concept grow, one of the struggles or barriers to even getting into additional schools is having those local professionals and academic experts in those areas make those connections. Because I think that's something that, you know, Kate, Mika and I are all in Boston and we have a lot, you know, this is a huge group of people and we have connections all over. And that's, that's one of the hopes coming out of this is that we would make local connections, right? Because we can't even get the curriculum to the students unless we can get the schools to buy in and then the students to engage with local examples. And um, so I, that's the issue that I see, but excited to uh, take it on, obviously. there's a discussion oh sure I mean I mean honestly in education rural schools are always a, uh, always um kind of uh disadvantaged because of I mean honestly because of the distance but I, I think that one of the things that has been really beneficial in the pandemic um is that it's just like what we're doing right now is is all the access um that zoom and online learning has provided um so um I think that that would be a really cool though pilot. Like, you know, when you're thinking about doing, it's good to do multiple pilots um, successively or, you know, pretty pretty closely, uh, if not simultaneously. And I think that one in a rural area, I mean, the thing about the rural areas is that kids are bused to um, to kind of a, uh, a county uh, middle school or high school and um, and you could still do it there. Um, you, would, you would have different kind of, um, 
physical models and 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 reference points. But that's what we should be doing in all of our communities is like is is customizing it for that community. Sorry about the dog. Right. That and that is that is a point of conversation that we had about that culminating project was should we pick a building in the community that isn't the school or just stick with the school. And the reason we wound up with the school was exactly for that reason of what if that community is not rich in you know, buildings that have a variety of interventions or conversations, you know, so everybody has a school building that's in a public school. So that was sort of an attempt to, to kind of get everyone on equal footing in that respect. But yeah, there's still modification. And I think we take advantage too of a lot of museums have sort of um, museum houses have sort of three-dimensional virtual tours now and things like that too, where you can walk students through a 3D space. It looks like we might have a new partner. It says the National Register is working on identifying nominations in need of updating uh, to capture a fuller story. We'd love to engage communities in the, this work, including school kids. What are the uh, what age range would this work for? I mean, I I think this is great, and I. You're frozen again, Helena. She maxed out on her video time. <laughs> well, does anybody else want to answer well, that I, question? I can step up for her behalf. Thank um, you, Mika. I, I think when we, we get into this middle school group, it's really a great time to advocate for these students and start to give them a voice. Um, so that as you move forward throughout the years, you know, I've found through, you know, a lot of the outreach work that I've done, by the time we get to high school students, if the first time they're hearing about preservation is 10th grade, that's that's far too late, right? So if we can use curriculum like this as kind of the foundation for introducing these concepts, then you have a whole population of students who can move forward. You know, they do a curriculum like this in sixth grade. We can have those students then become more involved with other programs like, like helping the National Registrar because they've learned a little bit and they have this background and they kind of have a little bit of a passion or an inkling that this is something that they really feel strongly about and, and you're getting students that have a background that can be engaged at the same time. I'll add just from, from the perspective of listening to your talk that it that it sounds like even just a small contribution, the idea of you know identifying a site that's near than they might be familiar with that is on the register that needs updating, just soliciting their input on why it's significant to them or to their community members, you know, their family and getting a more kind of diverse perspective of, of why a place might be significant. You know, I find that, that young people, particularly school age kids sometimes will cut to the quick more quickly about why a place matters to them than some of us who are really entrenched in the field and kind of overthink things sometimes. So that, that might be a, a fun way to do it. The other thing also from a racial justice and you know, indigenous rights um, perspective is there's a lot of land in rural areas um, that was taken. And if you want to kind of go a little deeper on that, there'd be a lot to talk about. And, um, and I think that that would be really interesting for the kids if they were kind of hot on that to, to pursue. I definitely think we will be reaching out to Sherry Freer um for more involvement here that sounds terrific and Kate I think you were the one who said it's the 12 year old brain that's that's where where we have to hit that uh that development point so it's so true the more research you do on the 12 year old brain the more you're like we have to get them right now wow <clears throat> interesting uh question has anyone been else uh, been involved uh, with the Skype a scientist organization the very basic introduction to the field that my experiences with the program have been fantastic and students have been very engaged in the field. The Skype a scientist. No, but it sounds great. Yeah. That sounds, sounds really pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can do a Skype so a historic preservationist if there's not one down the street. So it sounds very similar to a program that runs here in Massachusetts called Mass STEM Hub. And what that does, it allows you to register as a, you know, an engineering architecture science professional 
list your background, list your bio, and then it will pair you with a middle school teacher and allow you as a professional to develop a relationship with that particular middle school teacher. So I've done it for a few years now. Again, my background is in structures and structural engineering. And what I get every semester then is a teacher at a middle school. Um, I asked for middle school, you can't get a high school teacher um, through the state and you get to pop into their classroom a couple times in the term. And, you know, I teach them a little bit about bridges. You know, we, we saw that in the, the core curriculum, there is, there's a fair bit of learning about that. So I, you know, I come in the first week of the lesson and I talk about what I do as an engineer and how I work on structures and what I like to learn. And then I'm popping in two weeks later after they've been doing a little bridge activity and playing with the modules online. And I sit and critique what they've done and ask them questions and, and then they reevaluate them. And then I come back again in two weeks and we talk about how they've improved over the course of semester and working with these small groups. Um, and it, it's something that I really have enjoyed and it, it's another great program that's out there. Um, and it allows me to make connections with these teachers and hopefully they're ones in the future then that you know, if I've spent some time in their classroom, they'd be willing to pick up this curriculum as well. There's, there's a, a slightly similar program that exists I know around the country called the ACE Mentorship Program that's architecture, engineering, you know, construction engineering. So um, professionals from those fields that will partner with high schools that have kind of a, a basically a, an introductory architectural studio. Um, and they'll work with them throughout the year. I know um, one of my colleagues here in the office, uh, Laura Hall, she's one of the founders of the, the ACE mentorship program in San Antonio. And, uh, you know, the, I've heard from the professionals who have done it, how rewarding it is, but also just how impressive the high school students are at design and, and really really latching onto those concepts and understanding it and how many, a surprising amount of them that will then go into the field, either architecture, engineering, or construction afterwards, and it, it kind of acts as a launch pad for their careers, so. There is a comment um, <clears throat> that says, uh, thank you for these wonderful presentations, yes. Another initiative working in the area of conservation and preservation in the US is held in trust a collaboration between the National Endowment of Humanities and the American Institute of, for Conservation. Um, to what extent does your work intersect with the concepts of cultural heritage? And then should, there are two, two uh, websites that are, that are linked into that chat, but I guess answering the question, how does it intersect with cultural heritage? Okay, one of you's got to take the lead on that one. Well, I'll step up to the there plate. Thank uh, you. I am a member of those organizations um, and it does connect. Um, one of the things that going into this that I shared with the group is uh, the work that I did in India, which is represented by the background in dealing with K through 12 uh, work I, I've done K through 12 work in India at Hampi to connect the villages of Hampi around this historic site, which is the seat of the Hindu religion, in a, a network of people who are similarly interested in the issues in India. Um, this is related to also the Indian chapter of the APT. So going forward, um, there is a lot of connection, and it, it is an ongoing discussion. Glad to have the question. Thank you. Well, you guys are in, in the Boston areas, so uh, the reference to brutalism begs my question. Are there teaching units focused on appreciation and advocacy for the ugly buildings, the brutalists and uh, roadside architecture, pink plastic flamingos uh, even, and why many people think they are ugly. Yeah, so something we didn't get into in too much detail that i um, working on with a few uh, professionals is the lessons that would accompany that final two week unit of the community-based project where we sort of talk a little bit about sustainability, resiliency, um, the other ideas that we've thrown around are, you know, using that also as an opportunity to introduce them to architecture from other parts of the world 
and to have them build on that ability to notice, observe, you know, what that what the differences in architecture from what they see around them and the images that they're seeing might say about the way of life, the culture, the climate, things like that. Another idea that we've thrown around that I would love to incorporate to your point is an appreciation of ugly buildings and, you know, this this concept of uh, intentional neglect, right? Like we don't like to take care of things we don't like very much. And so that's kind of left us in a, in a tough spot with brutalist buildings. Um, but I think that those are, for this age group, those are more interests. And I think that we would develop them. One of the overarching goals, as I mentioned earlier, was to once we get the middle school curriculum sort of up and running and implemented in a variety of places is to then think about, you know, branching to a lower grade level and, a, and to high school and to create a rhythm of intervention right through the public school K through 12 curriculum. So I think that, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of brutalist architecture and, you know, all of that stuff um, they might get a taste of it in this curriculum, but it might be something that we we punt till high school as well. Well, one of the things I like about doing this this claim evidence reasoning is kind of a a core point of how we approach this. Is you know we talk to the students or in this curriculum about what is qualitative and quantitative, and you know, qualitative things. Um, you know, somebody might find brutalist architecture ugly and somebody might find it looking strong and powerful. And neither of those is wrong so long as the students can vocalize it properly and come up with a reasoning that supports it. Um, so I think for a lot of the stuff in architecture, it, it falls in a gray area. It's not right or wrong. You just need to have a reason for it. And somebody else may not agree with it, but it doesn't mean that your reasoning isn't rational and it isn't correct in some way. Um, so I think making sure that student understand that, you know, when, when you have a point, you have a feeling and you, you find something significant, you need to pull together all the things to advocate that for that in a way, even if somebody else doesn't necessarily agree with you. There's a comment about... Thank you for the fascinating preservation and discussion. Photographs are great educational tools, but don't forget paintings as a way to explore the past. I think this is great. And it actually, I had mentioned that I've been watching these educational webinars put on by the Getty and, and they, they exclusively um, you know, talk about evaluating works of art, whether they be paintings or artifacts or things like that. So I completely agree. I think that you know, works of art can capture not just the physical environment, but the the emotions and the, you know, the, the context of the time. And I think that that is, you know, noted, and there's a lot of great resources out there. And I think one of the things that Kate's been really great at, too, is understanding that, you know, we're targeting sixth grade, but especially with the recent pandemic, a sixth grade's abilities are not necessarily at a sixth grade standard. So we have made the lessons intentionally either such that you could make it harder and you could do these extensions or you could make it, you know, easier and sort of what scaffolded Kate and, you know, you, you give them more of the parts and pieces. But I think that this idea of, okay, now let's interpret artwork. Um, that's a potential extension. That's really natural, I think, to the curriculum that we're developing. So I think it's a great idea. And I think there's a lot of great content out there already that we can piggyback off of pretty easily. floor is open for other discussions or comments or questions. <clears throat> and I know there's this, this ebb and flow and, and Michael, you brought that to the forefront in your discussion very thoroughly about all of these kind of, you know, chugging into, into the profession. I know here in, in Texas, the Texas Society of Architects had a teach the teachers um, kind of program for a few years. It really is kind of dependent on the, who, who's the engine, you know, trying to lead these things in. Um, did you find, I guess, what kind of linkages did you find, Michael, in your kind of engines pushing the curriculum? The engines um, in most cases have been the people who care um, 
And the people who care vary um, across the world, um, whether in, in my experience, uh, whether it's India or China or Cambodia or wherever, um, in many cases, um, they've had kids of their own, uh, struggled with the issue, um, or are responsible for kids. Uh, there's um, a sensitivity, uh, as I ratchet back in my mind, uh, yeah, there's a sensitivity in their own education of how they were deprived and learned about things um, for the first time, as you know, Anna mentioned this at the outset in, in her comments uh, just recently, um, how someone gives you a goal or an idea at some point in your development. Um, and that um, is a kind of mind altering experience. Part of it is, I think, the fact that the individual teacher pays attention to the student and forms that linkage. We all learn best by having teachers who pay attention to us, that's fundamental. And in many cases, we go through the educational system uh, without establishing that linkage. What we're doing is reestablishing just as you know, Dewey had suggested, a linkage between what it is that the student needs and wants to learn um, and what it is that the teacher has the ability by virtue of having the time to teach, if only there's in essence uh, mutual excitement. And that's, uh, always been true and I think will always be true. The problem we, we face uh, again is marshalling the social resources and that's what Lena and I are trying to do here. It's creating the social network that will extend beyond what it is that we're, we have done. Um, but also looking back on it, as I mentioned earlier, because the, the ebb and flow is, is linked to the amount of funding that will essentially flow to the teachers and the people become involved. Um, that's what I think becomes essential. And not only the National Council, but the AIA, um, certainly the APT and other organizations should be aware of the linkage that has to be created. Um, I would add that many of the organizations have changed rather substantially, um, not just in this country, but in other countries. The nature of the discussion, as I tried to point out, has changed uh, considerably. You know, Kate's comments about the need for uh, establishing equity as a concern is uh, something which, you know, uh, 40 years ago, wasn't the concern that it is today. It's a different concern 40 years ago than it is today. Um, it wasn't that we didn't pay attention um, to uh, environmental justice or racial inequality, um, but we've come to a different point. And the, I won't say the, the underside or, or the the advantage of COVID, if there is any advantage of COVID, is it gives us an opportunity to think through priorities that we have in common. Um, and that is, I hope, what we're doing going forward. Are there any other questions or comments out there? I know that there were several people who could not get on the link initially and came in late. And I'll uh, just let everybody know that, that this presentation will be on the NICP a website, the National Council for Preservation Education. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, probably not today, but it will be up there soon for, uh, for y'all to, uh, to view the, in its entirety if you weren't here or if you need to refresh your course 
which I know I do. I need to go back and look at parts of it again because I didn't didn't uh, uh, keep track well enough. So, any last minute thoughts? So I'll say thank you to my to my fellow presenters and to Sue Ann and and Lena and Kate and Mika. I'm really looking forward to hearing about the results of the initial pilot. And uh, I think it's something we'd love to do in Texas. Yeah, and I'll just say um, that sounds amazing. And anyone involved in this call, reach out to us if you're interested in becoming more involved. We're always looking for people to help, especially as we're trying to grow the initiative into other parts of the country. So thank you. And different very topics as well, like the, exactly. the historic preservation ones or the National Register ones. So we'll be in touch, Sherry. Mika, Kate, thank you very much for you know being the guinea pigs, I guess, in, in, in taking this forward. It sounds like it's been a great success. So. Thank you for having yeah. us today. It's, uh, it's been a lot of fun, so I, I can't wait to see where it goes. Good. I like what, when people say they're having fun. So yep. uh -huh. Same. Well, thank all of you for attending. And I hope you have enjoyed it. And, and uh, I, I know that I have.